Jai Hind, welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achins. I'm sure all of you can recognize someone very special sitting next to me, Mr. Sanjay Dixit from the Jaipur Dialogues. Sir, thank you so much. I think that, you know, the small introduction that I gave you is far beyond what I could comprehend in terms of what work that you're doing in terms of educating the Indian public about the reality of various different situations around the country. I'm grateful for the work that you do. I follow you and I'm honored that you've joined me for a discussion on an Indian hangover of the West. Thank you very much, Adi. Thank you for this uh, very, very kind introduction. I'm happy to be here with you. Sir, can I begin with the first question, sir? This whole Western hangover that we talk about, sir, tell the what is this? And, you know, one thing which, which kind of disturbs me is why have we carried on with this uh, whole hangover? And lastly, is it all bad? Uh, well, uh, let me take the latter part first. It's not all that bad if we can distinguish. The problem is uh, why we have this hangover and why it is bad is precisely because we are not able to uh, distinguish between the roots, not able to distinguish between the logic on which the Western system operates and on which the Indian system operated for thousands of years. And uh, that creates the basic problem because the entire Western system operates, subsists, thinks, acts, everything that it does is on a binary logic uh, in a black and white kind of a situation. And uh, I've seen this, even the uh, great thinkers like Hegel and uh, Kant and uh, uh, even for that matter, the great socialists, the Rousseau, Hobbes, Locke, with the political scientists, even scientists, great scientists, some of them, uh, rather most of them, until, un un until I Einstein brought in the concept of relativity. They were all boxed in and they all uh, would go in the binary thinking that uh, their religion, the Abrahamic faith, imposed on their thinking and on their conscience. Whereas the Indian wisdom has never looked at things in two shades. The objectivity that uh, defines the Indian tradition, and that is why we have uh, such a great tradition of sciences. Mm. In fact, what has happened is that the Sanskrit language is a much maligned language because they try to malign it as some kind of a language that is based on just spirituality and it is only teaching spirituality. But if you really look at the works that are available today in Sanskrit, and only about 5% is spirituality. 95% is what we call Laukika Jnana. That is the worldly wisdom. And... Uh, the system that we inherited from the British, of course, the, we had the Macaulay education system and we had the elites and all the elites, of course, uh, at the time at the turn of uh, the 1950s, uh, it was a transfer of power. So transfer of power was from one set of elites to another set of elites. Uh, everything remained the same. The military elites remained the same. The bureaucratic elites remained the same. The academic elites remained the same and uh, only the color of the flag changed. And uh, if you look at even our constitution, our constitution is 80% Government of India Act 1935. Mm -hmm. And uh, a bit of uh, wisdom taken from Ireland, something from the Bill of Rights of the United States, something from here, something from there, and the directive principles of course came from the island but then we had the uh, uh, USSR and China were always uh, I think the apple of the eye of uh, our first prime minister so we had this hodgepodge in which it was thought and it, it was generally conveyed to the elites that uh, the 
Indian systems, the Indian traditions, the Indian culture. It was all something that needed to be badly reformed. And it was all some sort of a superstition. It was some sort of a regression that we needed to come out from. And if you have the kind of binary thinking, which you can also call a blinkered thinking, then you know where you will get going on that vehicle. So that is what has actually resulted in this kind of a situation today. And it is only now when we have started comparing things, then we have started uh, talking about uh, comparative religions, not only in the departments of philosophies, but in, out here in the open. And when we have started demonstrating that we come from much deeper tradition, that our our tradition of whether it is the sciences and of course the spirituality, there's, there's no comparison as far as the West is concerned. The worldview of the West is completely confined to the material aspects. Whereas a man, as you would know, and you would experience the, the, the experience of a human being is so multicolored that he realizes at times. And that's why you see there's so much of money being spent on uh, uh, what is called this, this psychiatric diseases, that uh, the man ultimately finds himself inadequate that because uh, uh, physical wants have been met, materially he's got everything what he wants, but he still feels that, well, he doesn't have what it takes. Hmm. So this is the reason that uh, we always had this inferiority complex towards the West, and that has conditioned almost every set of elites that we have, whether uh, it is in the bureaucracy or it is uh, uh, in the military or even more acutely in the judiciary. Mm. Uh, all aspects, we have that. The, the, the only people who brought something Indian were actually the politicians. But then the politics here was as such that they were made to feel small by this set of elites. It includes the academia and the media as well. So I think it's only last five, 10 years that uh, we are pushing back. And that's why you see this conflict. So I'll keep the pushing back for the next question, but I'd like to dwell upon something that you said, which, which, which makes me wonder about something that, and I've heard you saying this on multiple shows as well. The good boy image, you know, India always wanted to be the good boy of the world that he listens to everyone, you know, this and that. One of the things that I realized that sometimes we've taken steps which were against our own interests. Uh, we've agreed to certain things which were against our own interests. Was this because we were just afraid of the whole power of narrative that we will be termed as a bad boy or the adverse effect of the power of narratives on the domestic politics? I think a bit of both, a bit of both, a bit of both. Uh, just as I said that there's no clear black and white, there's always that shade of gray. <clears throat> and um, uh, I think our first prime minister was uh, under great influence of the West. And of course, the person who was responsible for putting him in was actually, uh, I should say, uh, was a great critic of the Western culture. Yet he found someone who was uh, absolutely a brown sahib to actually lead the country. Hmm. So at that time, uh, when I critique uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, then I find that even he suffered from this. And he also suffered with this need for validation, the validation that he used to get this validation from his Islamic friend so much so that ultimately led India into the partition, wittingly or unwittingly, we are not sure. But then that, that was the net effect of uh, his quest for validation from the Islamists, starting with the Khilafat movement. And uh, then probably his need for validation led him to endorse uh, Jawaharlal Nehru as the president of the International Congress in 1946, when there was no support from him within the party, not even within the executive, not within the uh, Provincial Congress Committee, not within the Congress in general. Mm -hmm. But then uh, 
using his own support base of the Congress, he kindly, he's kind of acted as a dictator and pushed him and uh, made him the, then what is called the uh, virtual prime minister. Of course, the technical term was something different. I think vice chairman of the governor's, uh, the, the governor general's council. <clears throat> so that was de facto prime minister of India. And he owed his position entirely to a person who ostensibly criticized the Western material values. And yet he put into place a person who was all sold out on the Western Fabian socialism. And uh, when I critique Nehru, I am a very big critic of Nehru. I'm, of course, a critic of uh, Gandhi as well, but more so of uh, Nehru. I find in his character uh, certain traits which were of self-loathing. He, he, he was the kind of uh, Indian, uh, the self-loathing kind, whom uh, we found proliferated later on. And when we talk about why we have this Western hangover, then that trait of self-loathing persists. And uh, you, you will find it in among uh, all shades of elites. I come from the bureaucracy. I have spent 35 years in the bureaucracy. Find it here as well, though a little, a little less compared to uh, maybe certain other vocations, such as the media. Intelligence, yeah, media, yes. Sir. <laughs> intelligence, 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 yeah. But and it is there, but then we get tempered because then we... Uh, uh, come to contact with the public. And when you come into the pub, uh, contact with the public, I have seen even in my initial years in the bureaucracy, we always had this tendency of thinking that, okay, these guys, you know, these, uh, they, they belong to some anti diluvian times and they need to be reformed and they need to be brought up to speed and, they're brought to, and they need to be brought up to date. You know, that kind of disdain that uh, uh, we had uh, through our training in, in the Masuri Academy, for instance. And later on, we realized that we knew nothing compared to these people. But these people inherited the great tradition of the country. They, they, they inherited the uh, multi-valued logic which drove this uh, civilization, which made this civilization. After all, what is the, what are the uh, elements that make up this civilization and that make it very different from the West. Those are our time concepts and our logic concepts and our concepts of uh, open questioning and uh, uh, what I call the, our uh, uh, attitudes towards scientific method. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, when we go a little more uh, deeper into philosophy than our epistemology, how we look at the uh, proof. It's not based on a book. It is based on direct evidence. It's based on direct experience. So this was what, this what sets this uh, country apart. Is, I, um, in this context, I am very fond of quoting an experience that I had in the villages that uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll narrate it in Hindi because it took place in Hindi. I think your, sure, audience, will, like, your audience can understand Hindi. So this was this, this uh, old village woman and uh, maybe somehow the, the concept of theft, theft came up. Uh, that uh, old woman, very innocently, she said, okay, in her own dialect, okay, just just pause and think on this. You know, I was totally blown and shaken and, and for three or four days, uh, I couldn't do anything else. I said, when she says that then you get the whole idea of a context. You understand? The whole context. And why? Because uh, we do not, we, all our texts are based on context. There's no text without a context in the Indian mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you say theft is bad, this comes straight from the Bible, it's written in the book, there's no context. The yeah. playfulness of a child 
the playfulness of a child that uh, you see in bhagwan krishna for instance that is the playfulness of a child is the things that uh, are absolutely with a pure mind what would you call that but as per bible it will be called theft and the man the person would be condemned to hell so that is where you get the whole context based understanding of the indian situation that's what makes the governance in india so difficult also and that is why you need a very a great mind to be able to govern india because there are no automatic black and white binary situations here first you have to understand the context then you have to act accordingly i must say so that's a very deep answer and that's going to get me to think for a little bit in a whole lot of audience as well because the whole understanding of tradition you've kind of put that into question with regards to the uh, amalgamation of the two civilizations cultures histories with regards to the understanding of what is right and what is wrong and that's a that's a that's a very important thing because what may be right for us may be wrong for them and it's the other way around so it's is the whole as you said contextual understanding that is you know gone wrong it's 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 an amazing story i must say it's something and i i'll take your permission to kind of quote this somewhere because oh yes absolutely in the, fact I, i i don't know whether you have read my krishna trilogy books i uh, haven't so that i have to because this is something that you've mentioned that friend. is uh, that is based on the krishna story actually that uh, i wrote those uh, that it's a trilogy i have written two of them Mm-hmm. the third one is still to come and uh, i i could figure out that our youth uh, could not connect to the krishna story because the krishna story at a very deep spiritual level and the youth and most of us are actually at the level of intellectual uh, at the level of intellect and we are not able to nor we are willing to transcend our intellect which is the teaching of this land that you have to actually transcend your intellect you have to go beyond everything you know that even Ki- bhagavad gita says that uh, if you have the direct experience you do not even need the vedas you know chapter 246 shloka so you do not even need the vedas yavanarthe udpane sarvatah samplato dake avan sarvesh videshu brahmanasya vijanata just like you, you are uh, sitting next to a flood of waters you don't need a small pond similarly someone who has direct experience doesn't need the veda so th- that is our uh, understanding we are actually and uh, the the entire indian tradition is an experiential framework and Uh, when you read the krishna story in an intellectual framework you will be misinterpreting it what i did was that i did the krishna story i brought it down to the intellectual framework and so those two stories have been written i have i, I call it intellectualizing it as so that i have tried to intellectualize the krishna story i must say the which choice of words are very interesting sir brought it down to the intellectual framework which is the, that's that's a very interesting choice of word which tells you that the indian experience that you sp- speak about is a learning through the journey rather than learning through a book uh, exactly exactly that is, that that's, is that's very, why the 2.46 of the bhagavad gita is very very that's a very powerful uh, shloka which i indeed sir try and uh, recite every day just in order to get the hack of it every day you get a, a, a better meaning so this is the essence of uh, the indian way and uh, the western way of course uh, we, it is limited to the intellect very powerful intellect of course and uh, whatever achievements they have all it very uh, powerful intellectual achievements a lot of it uh, uh, based on theft actually <laughs> then but <laughs> but then 
uh, right now uh, they have uh, with their uh, um, colonialism then the hmm. the coloniality that they bred in us through that colonialism through the instrument of colonialism and um, they colonized us into a situation of coloniality which has continued and um, if you really go back and look at their scientific advancement and uh, that you wonder how suddenly somebody could uh, uh, get into great discoveries like uh, uh, infinite series and calculus and things when 100 years prior they did not have a concept of zero and it is then that now the present research shows that all of it was purloined yeah used a very sweet term for that, that i must say <laughs> purloined from india you used so a very sweet term who came to kerala and and then you look at uh, the the kerala school of mathematics uh, and uh, how that whole uh, knowledge got transported but of course they never acknowledged it and uh, they uh, otherwise theft is bad but then if you uh, steal it from uh, what is called a non faithful or a heretic then of course the doctrine of discovery is applicable you know the doctrine of discovery absolutely yes sir so the doctrine of discovery becomes applicable so it doesn't matter whether we had it for uh, thousands of years as soon as they discovered it then by that uh, papal bull of uh, i think 1492 uh, they became the owners because doctrine of discovery says whatever they whatever a christian first sets his foot on or first sets his sight on it he becomes the owner of it mm. that is the doctrine of discovery it's a sad uh... and, and, and just to add that you know in the 19th century uh, the us supreme court actually endorsed it you know because uh, uh, when the native indians they thought that a, uh, democracy has come and there's a great republic and there are these uh, great uh, notions of equality and uh, liberty and things then uh, they actually went to supreme court said that these lands have been stolen from us So then the U.S. Supreme Court said, "No, doctrine of discovery reigns supreme. The Christians discovered it, so they have it." That spellbounding, sir. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you now. You mentioned about the realization, and that's something which is interesting to me. Which I see, as you said, there's a trickle of realization. Having said that, I'd like to just take a small example. During COVID, when you know things were bad in India, just like any other country, articles and posts and talks about how India is doing wrong and all that, and we used to actually get affected. Uh, today, if you look at it with the Russia-Ukraine war, the same articles, the same posts, the same people are criticizing India, and today we say no, we don't care. Keep saying it's our interest. We look for it. What has changed? i have uh, talked about it a couple of times and uh, uh, i think uh, a lot of people have been talking about this for uh, so many days so a little bit of realization may have dawned on to the uh, foreign policy mandarins also but i have known dr jay shankar uh, he is that uh, sort of uh, well rooted kind of a guy who understands these things and he has this inimitable style of uh, <clears throat> being able to carry it that uh, he can say something very drastic something uh, absolutely i should say uh, a, a sledge hammer kind of a thing with such a soft intonation <laughs> and uh, i think it is only since he has come that he started pushing back in this uh, this this way and it's been openly said and to say that uh, uh, in the us in those think tanks you know those snooty those uh, what is called 
looking down upon everyone else and those kind of things tends to go there and to tell them that we don't need your validation that takes uh, i think uh, some courage really yeah. some strength and that really needs some spunk indeed there's no question sir i think uh, so what you mean to say is basically a change in the political thinking with regards to india and uh, with regards to the whole subject which is brought yes, about yes as far as the external affairs are concerned i am i am quite okay with it so i have been saying this that this is one aspect of the present government that uh, i am fairly okay with it's uh, this present government i criticized only on the internal security uh, and uh, on the uh, on its tendency to uh, not just appease but to actually uh, completely lie prostrate in front of uh, those what is called the demanding communities that Indeed. that's what i am that i agree about. with you sir there is no question absolutely right sir so i think you've hit the nail on the spot when you mentioned the entire change and especially coming to the internal security which is which brings me to my next question so every country has its critics and there is no question um, even in of course a authoritarian regime like china we have internal critics and we hear from them time and again of course they go missing after some time but that's a different story altogether india also has these critics but one of the things that we note about these critics in india is they are not willing to participate in a debate or a discussion within india their entire focus seems to be you know focusing outside and participating in a debate about india with non indians and in a non indian platform what seems to be the purpose of this misdirection misdirected criticism and it profounds me to just ask the simple word question why that is because our internal security operator somehow feels that they need validation something that our external security is uh, that uh, our external affairs uh, apparatus has got out of that uh, doesn't seem to have gone away as far as the internal security apparatus is concerned mm -hmm. and uh, the top echelons are too concerned about uh, the criticisms that they get in spite of the external affairs ministry telling everybody that they do not care about the opinions of uh, motivated uh, institutions like the uscirf or the human rights organizations in fact they call them as lobbies mm -hmm. this is this is the external affairs ministry yes. a minister himself has called them as lobbies is called them as uh, motivated and uh, they do that day in and day out uh, in the international fora uh, in fact they even uh, decried this islamophobia Uh, adoption of islamophobia resolution in the united nations and they yes. said that uh, you, you can't have uh, this as some kind of a one off because you have to then call out the entire religiophobia because uh, we also suffer we also at the uh, receiving end of it mm -hmm. so but, uh, i do not know why the ministry of home affairs has this dire need of uh, listening directly to these busy bodies and uh, not actually take the lessons from the external affairs ministry who has been dealing with it so beautifully and there seems to be some disconnect and um, i have been very critical of the national security advisor because uh, uh, i think uh, he seems to be too fond of uh, his own mistaken love with the sufis and such people what exactly they are i have laid down in my book so they doesn't seem to have any understanding of that history and he seems to be going totally against his own credo what he used to spout before 2014 and what he is doing now this complete disconnect at that time he used to say that uh, I'll, I'll, uh, he said that in hindi uh, it was very powerful jo bhi rashtra न्याय को शक्ति से अधिक महत्व देता है और विचार को कर्म से अधिक महत्व देता है इतिहास उसे क्षमा नहीं करता एंड नाउ यू सी व्हाट इज डूइंग 
completely messed up jammu and kashmir mm-hmm. single handedly mm-hmm. reintroducing the dulat doctrine after that wonderful step that the government of india had taken the ministry of uh, home affairs uh, had uh, guided that entire operation of uh, making the article 370 ineffective it was a master class and instead of taking it to its logical conclusion by telling everybody else or all the busy bodies uh, to hold off this is our own business and we will take care of it that uh, suddenly the matter was handed over to the nsa and then he made a mess of it because he is an old tulak doctrine aficionado and uh, he's brought that whole tulak doctrine uh, on the back door i can say that from my own information that mr tulak has direct access to the kashmir division the joint secretary kashmir division uh, is in direct touch with uh, mr tulak and you know what mr dulat had done this entire uh, crisis of kashmir is in no small amount owed to mr dulat than to isi yeah and i am i am using those terms and using that uh, those words very very responsibly so this uh, whole business i remember you know uh, uh, this guy ashwini upadhyay organized this small uh, uh what is called a rally mm-hmm. it wasn't even a rally on jantar mantar or something first they did not give him permission and after that they arrested him for doing what what was he demanding that do away with the british laws the the, the laws that were enacted during the british times you do away with them and how can it be a more innocuous demand but he was still arrested why he was arrested and uh, the, the police officers were saying telling him ki al jazeera pe chal raha hai <laughs> al jazeera pe chal raha hai so that bloody al jazeera that uh, what is called the scum of a man that called mehndi ar hasan is now going to determine how the delhi police is going to act al jazeera pe chal raha hai so this is what happened in that <laughs> nupur sharma and qatar affair i guess <laughs> al jazeera pe chal gaya hoga i don't so i, I think the, the 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 internal security is in a mess complete mess and mm. the, the whole thing is that they have an examples from within india to follow they have the example of uh, how some capable chief ministers are dealing with it yep you can see how um, uh, Uh, among bjp chief ministers yogi adityanath and uh, himant bishwa sharma how they deal with these situation and uh, among non bjp uh, chief ministers look at how navin patak deals with these situations so they can draw examples right from within india and they don't have to succumb to these al jazeera type people and so, i don't know but somebody said that actually the ministry of external affairs were very deeply miffed because of this uh, uh, direct qatar intervention into our internal security without having the external affairs ministry on board why i am drawing this only from what is called uh, circumstantial evidence mm-hmm. because only two days after that they gave a very terse reply to oic on the same question yeah. on which the uh, home ministry or rather why home ministry even nsa jumped into it they had succumb and on on that very question they, they gave a very proper fitting and strong reply to the organization of islamic conference and after that the entire thing changed Uh, after that the entire thing changed absolutely we seem so, to have picked up a little power uh, within as well after that particular statement you're right sir very very so what what's going on i mean this is uh, absolutely inexplicable absolutely mm. indeed sir indeed but sir at this moment i'd like to say one thing very very critical 
you know it's about uh, today in india one thing that we've realized and we can see with various events around us that public perception and public opinion is not about uh, you know not to be taken lightly anymore when indians get together and say this is what will happen it is what is going to happen there has been resistance there has been this thing there has been that thing but the move goes on and i'd like to actually say this and i'm not saying this because you're on my show sir but you know alternative media uh, like yourself at the jaipur dialogues and a lot many more people have done a tremendous job with regards informing people of what they can and can't do and they can and should do if i may you know i don't want to get into the can't part, part of it but what they should think and what they should research for themselves so that is something which is very very interesting and we've also seen that uh, we've we've also seen that in the general mass of the country today there is a certain amount of awareness of indianism if i may use that word it's a, it's probably not a <laughs> very right thing for me to say but indianism has become a very proud thing we were not as proud of it before now when i come to this we don't have a structured counter propaganda system within our country sir we have people individuals individual organizations who are doing counter propaganda who are doing narratives who are doing information warfare if i may but we don't see a governmental structure trying to destroy or you know deface certain organizations that you mentioned like for example the al jazeera which is causing us a lot of, and you one must see the kind of clips that al jazeera puts up with regards to the farmers protest with regards to the caa with regards to various different things that happened is there no realization within the within the structure of the country that we need a counter propaganda system we need an international media for for it to project outward what is happening here sir i think uh, when you say that western hangover it uh, uh, displays itself in its starkest in our uh, internal security <laughs> and the indians are aware as you rightly said yeah. that the indians through the internet and uh, through the alternate media they are more and more aware they are consuming diverse opinions now mm-hmm. it's not just the one way opinion that used to hold forth say about 5 6 7 or 10 years back uh, uh, i think the things have changed immeasurably uh, over the last 5 years mm-hmm. and that's also because of the digital revolution so uh, that goes to the uh, positive side of what uh, the prime minister has done and the only thing is that uh, once you have uh, let the genie out there's no way you can put it back <laughs> so even even if the prime minister wants that uh, the people uh, do not go the path of uh, uh, Go, go, do not go on the path of uh, searching their roots and that's not going to happen mm-hmm. people will because that is the natural thing to do after your wants are satisfied the first thing you do is that you is look inwards and you try and find out you who are. you are mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is the that is the ultimate quest in fact that is even taught in the management uh, the in the management that's for self actualization that is the need after the uh, primary needs are all met so when you are <clears throat> looking for self actualization then that's what you will find and india is so incredibly rich in its uh, spiritual teachings in its uh, spiritual history the, the sheer variety the sheer diversity and of course our uh, basic teaching hmm? and that says that uh, he is one and he manifests himself in a uh, billion trillion multi trillion ways eko vashi sarva bhutantaratma ekam rupam bahuda yah karoti 
एकम रूपम बहुधा यह करोती दट सेम वन फॉर्म मल्टीप्लाइज इन टू बहुधा डाइवर्स फॉर्म डाइवर्स so that is that is the basic wisdom of this land so that being the basic wisdom of this land that is why i have often distinguished between the abrahamic religions and the indian religions and say that okay that uh, our uh, walk or what we call our psychology is actually uh, fourfold mm-hmm. whereas the west west limits its psychology up to threefold up to the level of intellect the para or, or the beyond intellect is not for them so whatever they are envisioning or whatever uh, theory of religion they have it is limited to the intellect tangibility yes sir not even tangibility i mean what god is tangible no i mean the whole concept of they say that god is outside <laughs> tell me who seen that outside god we say that god is inside, inside. and we feel him every day mm-hmm. so where is the tangibility we have the tangibility yeah it's the Not opposite way around i think yes absolutely sir hmm. so um, i think uh, the prime minister would be well advised to actually support this search of the roots that uh, the population has gotten into and that is why uh, Amir Khan is crying today. That's exactly what I said. The public opinion is something which is far beyond uh, anybody's control. So if people decide this is what it is, this is what it is, and there's hardly anything anybody can do about it because it's people have stood their own ground and realized, listen, we're going to do this, and there's nobody pressurizing anybody. It's just something which is a, as you said, a self actualization or a self realization. of an indianism as a concept which is coming out so this has been a mind boggling interview i must say and i'm going to think about that story that you told me about this old woman who and I, you know it's something which is going to ring in my head for some time because it's detailed out in my books those two krishna trilogy books absolutely i think i'm going to read that right now because there is something which which tells us that there is a lot more that what we can see and perceive um the whole perception about india is something that we've accepted from the world and which i call a western hangover uh, we've not really understood what being an indian actually means and today i think with a whole lot of this discussion that like uh, what you know we are having a lot more which is taking place is a very small level i think that realization is coming in and trust me sir i'd like to thank you for one taking us through that this entire thing making us understand the why's the what's and the where offs of this entire concept of uh, the indian hangover that we carry on our on our backs on our heads and i think every day that we do things we have this innate feeling that we need to be liked by the west i think that's something that uh, you've brought out very clearly and i'd like to thank you for that because it's it's something that all of us as indians must realize So thank you so much for gracing me on my small little channel uh it's it's an honor to speak to you and of course I'd appreciate a continued interaction with you with regards to learning more about the internal security as you mentioned of this country we're getting stronger and stronger in the external part of it but internally we do have weaknesses and that is where there is an opportunity for an adversary is to find cracks we'll discuss that in the next sometime sir till then thank you so much and jai hind thank you adi thank you very much jai hind vande matram vande matram sir